All right, thank you very much for staying with us. In preparation for COP27, the federal government recently launched its energy transition plan, which is purported to be its uh, homegrown data-backed and multi-pronged strategy to achieve net zero emissions by 2060, while solving energy poverty and lifting 100 million Nigerians out of poverty. The ETP focuses on five critical energy sectors, power, cooking, uh, uh, oil and gas, transport, and industry, and it's estimated to cost $1.9 trillion. However, there are critical questions on Nigeria's energy transition plan must grapple with if its success is anchored on gas being a critical transition fuel. Gas infrastructure is expensive and investments are interdependent. Who will, who will finance it? Private or public? Future gas demand is unpredictable. Where is the demand going to come from? Nigeria's 2060 net neutrality goal is the ETP feasible? Well, let's get in these questions and more from my guest, who is a senior officer at the Natural Resource Governance Institute, Nigerian program, Tengi George Ikoli. Tengi, thank you so much. It's good to have you on the program. It's been a while. Thank you for having me. Yes. And now, like I said in my introduction, countries around the world have committed to reduce carbon emissions. Of course, Nigeria targeted net 2060 and has developed an energy transition plan. Now, what are your broad thoughts now, particularly on Nigeria's energy transition plan? Thank you for that question. Um, and as you say, we're at a very key point right now with COP27 currently ongoing. There are critical questions that the government must ask, any government must ask, when trying to develop an energy transition plan. For a country like Nigeria, it's even more important to consider because the impacts were a fossil fuel dependent economy that relies on revenues from, um, from the fossil fuels to address 50% of its needs for government revenues and then 90% of its foreign exchange earnings. We've seen what's been going on right now with Nigeria's foreign exchange um, and the rapid rises and the rapid um, comparison when it comes to, to dollar. And a lot of these considerations play a huge part. Questions to ask, does the government end a transition plan acknowledge the transition risk to oil and gas upstream revenues? That is where our foreign exchange largely comes from, how we are addressing this, how we're trying to mitigate those losses as other countries move away from fossil fuel use and our market shrinks. We had recently in the news where the government admitted to losing some of its trade partners. This is a direct risk, and it's important to know how the country, how the government is addressing this. Has the government identified the special and the specific impacts for Nigeria that is not currently contained in the end transition plan? Is it acting to reduce its exposure, not only in policy statements, but in decisions taken and the actual use of public money? That is making sure that it recognizes that Nigeria has a lot of needs in terms of its development aspirations, but then also this $1.9 trillion that it expects to fund the end transition. How is it spending its money? Is it spending it on things like subsidy that are not going to be beneficial to us in the long term? How are we planning to fund these different interventions? Public funding, when we have all these different issues with, with getting public funding, private sector, what are the enablers that we have put in place to make sure that we're able to attract public private funding in country and also externally, given the different complexities. All of these are different considerations that we expect for the transition plan. It addresses some of these things, but not all of them. All right, there. it's a very good way to start the conversation. My, 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 I have a planned uh, next question. I, I, I have that already on my mind, but I want to ask you, I, I'm one of those that would say we need crude oil to move away or to activate this transition plan. We still need crude one way or the other to sort all of this out. Do you agree with me, Tengi? Okay. It, this is a conversation and a narrative that I hear very often. It is not a zero-sum game. Even in Nigeria's energy transition plan, you will see that Nigeria has decided to leverage its gas as a transition fuel. So it still expects to look into its gas and leverage that. What we're saying is, if you've decided to use your oil and gas, how feasible is it? What are the timelines? What are the risks? And how are those being managed? You say you want to use, want to use oil and want to use gas. In what ways? 
gas for domestic um, energy use, which we have seen as an aspiration to bridge um, Nigeria's um, poor energy access. Um, we've also seen it as a way to potentially increase exports, but it's about asking about the feasibility of these things. Policies and plans are not the problem. Aspirations are not the problem. It's making sure that they're workable um, and able to be implemented. One, around our gas, for instance, we have all these different infrastructure challenges um, around our networks, um, around our pipelines, around our different infrastructures. We still don't have a very strong midstream um, and downstream infrastructure for gas, but the Petroleum Industry Act has created platforms and policies and um, enablers for this, but these have not yet been implemented. Fair enough, the, the, the act was passed last year. So this is a consideration. If we are going to leverage oil and gas, how do we make sure that it's feasible? There has been a lot of excitement around the interest um, with you. Europe, again, with the conflicts from Russia and Ukraine, and the opportunity that this could have brought for Nigeria's um, exports. But then if we look at the infrastructure that is required to get um, our gas from Nigeria, again, to the different um, infrastructure projects, one, the Nigeria Morocco project, and then also the Trans-Sahara project, those have not yet been completed. The needs that Europe has are now, but if Nigeria, and I've seen this, Nigeria is planning to ramp that up in the short, in the short term, it is planning for something where for, it is planning to solve a problem with the infrastructure now, but the need will likely um, reduce in the future because Europe has an ambition itself to start to look away from fossil fuels and start to look more at renewables. So we need to look at all these different things. Is it possible for us to actually invest so much money, which we've already established we do not have a lot of, into infrastructure that potentially will not give us the returns that we expect to give because we are planning to build infrastructure to address a need now, but it won't be ready in the future when the demand has likely reduced. So we need to be realistic and make sure that the places where we put our money, so if we have ongoing projects with gas, for instance, and oil, where is the best place to put our money? Is it better to put our money into those sort of projects or put our monies into projects that have not yet come into fruition? So we have to be very careful to avoid the potential for stranded assets and lock in risks when the world is moving away to cleaner energy sources. Mm, brilliant stuff uh, there. But now back to the transition plan. Do you think it is enough to help Nigeria navigate the risk to a fossil fuel dependent uh, economy, of course, as the world uh, moves? And how can it be improved upon if it's not enough? Thank you for that question. Um, at a recent event that we actually had, I think it was about last month, we had a national dialogue where we were able to bring Nigerians together to try to build a consensus to agree to evaluate, to discuss, to debate this transition plan to see if it was feasible, if it was enough, and what we needed to do. So um, from the conversation, this plan, it is seems very high level at the moment. So it doesn't break things down into the granular things around what is needed specifically to achieve these goals around the 100 million Nigerians out of poverty, um, energy access, um, ex transitioning um, those that will be in jobs now from oil and gas into other areas, um, and also streamlining our government plans. That is that, that level of detail is not currently in the plan. And the challenge with that is we expect private sector to come on board and invest. We expect Nigerians in their homes to switch from um, from um, from kerosene and charcoal to maybe gas and then bio and then electricity everything in the urban areas and then also the needs for those in the rural areas. We expect civil society to also properly understand this and let, let Nigerians understand what their roles are, how we need to move forward. We expect the different ministries, um, power, oil and gas, etc., to also key into this so that we can be able to move forward in one voice and be able to deliver on this goal of net neutrality by 2060. But the level of detail that is required to allow everybody to understand what their roles are is not necessarily provided. The linkages between our development plan to so our national development plan of 2021-2025 is not there. MTEF, how are all these things speaking to each other? And that is how we can improve it, to make sure that all our development plans speak to each other, to make sure that we have more detail, include civil society, in fact, 
when we have our granular details, inclusive society in terms of the monitoring and evaluation of the success of achieving these goals. Um, and this has been a good effort, at least. We have something that we can speak to. We have a plan that everybody can talk about and can certainly improve it. And as we go through the implementation process, there are certainly opportunities for greater conversation, greater debate, further inclusivity, and collaboration among stakeholders. I will add that at this juncture that we're in now, with a new government likely coming in next year, we have to make sure that the current aspirants and campaign um, aspirants for the presidential election, et cetera, are able to fully understand the risks to this energy of any transition and determine how what their approach will be in ensuring that all these gaps are filled and also that the plans are not potentially jettisoned as we see all our different plans um, that have happened in the past when new governments come on stream. So all of these things are things that we need to consider as we review the end transition plan and consider ways in which we can implement it in a way that is just, for instance, for those who are the Naya daughter that are suffering the impacts, that have suffered the impacts for years and are now looking to, um, are, now, are now looking to this new reality where their oil would no longer be um, the main focus and also now potentially might suffer more hazards. Where we need to make sure that everybody comes together, everybody is, has a conversation and we're thinking about this realistically for what this means for Nigeria now in, and into the future. Hmm. And let's move on quickly now to the COP27, which of course we've talked about and is ongoing. Uh, what should Nigeria be doing, of course, to make it work for them and it shouldn't just be a regular talk shop? That is a very critical question. Um, we saw at COP26 last year that South Africa was able to make COP26 really speak for them. They were able to get a commitment of $8.5 billion from different development countries. Nigeria, unfortunately, did not bring home a similar, um, a similar agreement. But with this energy transition plan and the associated um, investment plans that we have put forward, hopefully we'll be able to negotiate something similar. So a bit more of an explanation on the jets, on the way South Africa has gotten its, um, its commitments from last year. It put forward a just energy transition plan for coal. Nigeria has, now has gas. It can also consider something similar for gas. What this means is the world is moving away, but how can we make sure that we negotiate in a way that makes sure that Nigeria can get benefits, potentially taking away trade-offs from its gas and saying, we have committed to, for instance, end gas flaring by 2030. We need CCUS, um, which is carbon capture utilization system um, storage technologies. We need investments in certain areas to reduce our gas flaring. How can other countries come on board and earn their own carbon um, benefits from that, carbon credit benefits from that, while still giving us investments in ways that can improve our economy and set up a future for Nigeria that is beneficial in the long term. We have to make sure that Africa and Nigeria, being the giants of Africa, should set the stage and make sure that we critically assess and call other governments around the world to action for this hundred billion dollar emitting um, economies because nigeria obviously along with Af other african countries have only contributed about three percent to this climate change so we need to make sure that we're able to put and position nigeria and africa in a place where we can get the investments that we need because we have not been responsible for most of the climate, climate um, change, but the impacts, as we see in places like Bayelsa um, and around the country, where floods have also affected, affected Nigeria, that there will be a lot of impacts, both economically, both environmentally, that we need to contend with. We need to make sure that we also get um, capacity building and human resource development potentials, that we get technology for renewables, and that we get financing. Financing is key. We have $1.9 trillion to achieve the end transition plan. We have, which is 410, 000, um, 410 million dollars above business as usual, which is, which is $10 billion yearly. 
that is a lot of money. We are going to need a lot of international finance to bring into that space. And we need to negotiate and position Nigeria to be able to deliver on these things and get those benefits by having the right plans, having the right frameworks, showing consistency and continuity in how we engage and respond to the energy transition. Interesting stuff. Now, let's, let's wrap up on this note. Uh, what key resolutions? You touched on it in your third uh, submission. Should those aspiring to enter office, a uh, lot is in the plate. But what key resolutions do you think? There are obviously a lot, but I will highlight a couple of them. One, I've talked about this and alluded to this in my conversation and my, my submissions. The end transition plan should be an implementable action plan. You have to make sure that it is linked to our existing plans, our national development plan, our medium term expenditure framework, to make sure that it is realistic. There has been the Petroleum Industry Act that has been passed. Implementation of that is key in a way that is beneficial for Nigerians. We also need to ensure that inclusion and collaboration, inclusion with the stakeholders, civil society, host communities, private sector, et cetera, is key. Collaboration and cohesion of delivery by the different responsible actors of the federal government and different ministries is key, which is, an, is a monitoring and evaluation framework. How is this designed? How is it going to be implemented? What is the step-by-step -step requirements around this? And what are the modalities for funding? We have to be very flexible in the different funding options that we take in place, but make sure that these are not funding options that are detrimental to Nigeria's future and long-term successes. Another key one which I hadn't mentioned was around, is around solid minerals. Nigeria wants to play a role around renewables. It needs to make sure that the legacy conflicts in the solid mineral sector, as well as those legacy conflicts and legacy spills um, around the oil and gas sector are resolved before, be, before oil ceases to play, and oil and gas ceases to play the role um, a major role in our energy um, use across the world um, over the next couple of years. We need to make sure that the transitions are just in country and also the way we engage with the international community. We are thinking about ensuring that there is a just energy transition for Nigerians today and also for those that are coming on stream in the future. Interesting stuff there. I must thank you so much, Senior Officer of the Natural Resource Governance Institute and Nigerian Program, Tengi George Ikoli. Thank you. I do enjoy the rest of your day. I will reach out to you, obviously, when we have issues around your sector again. Thank you for having me. Have a good one. All right, then.